Well, as I've mentioned to you previously, I think this textbook is kind of jam-packed full of information, and Chapter 3 really is no exception to that. I will tell you, <laughs> you've heard me say this about other subjects already more than once, that I am no biological expert. I, uh, I did get good grades in anatomy and biology, but... Uh, you know, the, some of the specifics about this uh, rather cursory present, presentation of the biological self is um, a little beyond my area of expertise, and I trust you'll bear with me with this. As a social worker, we have to have an awareness of the body, and obviously this major functions and things, and because it does impact our clients, and and uh, our clients are, uh, well, the, it also has something to do with the interaction of our clients with the society as well. So it's it's certainly worth knowing these basic things. Um, and so as we go along here, please bear with me if um, some of my lack of expertise should show itself. But I think I can do this reasonably well, and I know enough about this uh, to have gotten through a 40-year career of social work, So so I must be doing okay. So in any event, this chapter really focuses upon the intersection of the interior biological self and the external environmental system in which it exists. So the interior and the exterior uh, intersect in, in some of the information that we have here. Now, there, there are two ways really to look at the body and its surroundings. Um, and the two terms here that are probably worth knowing is the proximal, which is the, the most interior of of, of anything and the distal which is moving outward from from the organic matter of the body into the environment so the proximal and the distal those are two terms that are probably worth remembering in this chapter we're going to look at the biological self through the perspective of two different lenses and the systems perspective and the constructionist perspective and by far, most of this chapter really focuses upon the systems perspective as it talks about the organs of the body and the various different systems that, that coordinate them and make them function together. You know, when uh, I was talking about systems theory when we covered chapter two and how my supervisor was a family therapist who really, really believed in systems theory. And another analogy that is maybe overused about systems theory is is the, uh, the parts of an engine, you know, which have, uh, and again, I'm not a mechanic either, but I mean, uh, there, are, there are pistons and there are, are spark plugs and there's a uh, fan belt and all these different kinds of things in the internal combustion engine that when you turn that key, something happens and and those things begin to operate and they operate in a certain sequence. And as long as they continue that, well, that dance, that coordination, the engine is going to run smoothly and the car will go. Likewise, with a family system, when, when each member of that family performs his, his or her own role in, in the sequence that is set forth by this family's patterns, then the family functions in a certain way. And, and so like for treating families with, with alcoholics, you know, one of the things you want to do is look at how those, those individual parts work together to, to set the stage for, for uh, alcoholics behaviors. In this particular situation here, of course, we're talking about the body and the body, as you know, have many different parts. And as long as our parts work together, we're healthy. When they don't, well, we're going to have problems. And so this is kind of how the systems perspective, I think, fits with this particular chapter. There are many different um, interior environment systems within the human body. This chapter focuses upon these six, and, and we're going to spend a little bit of time going over each one and talk a little bit about some of the disorders of some of these uh, systems. Uh, and because these are disorders that we're likely to run into as we go about our work in, in the social work field. Start with the nervous system. And one of the uh, disorders that you're going to run into from time to time are brain injuries. And uh, typically, we think of brain injuries in terms of traumatic brain injuries, where somebody's, for instance, been in a motorcycle am uh, uh, accident and hit their heads or something to that effect. And so their brain functioning, their brain was damaged sufficiently that it uh, they continue to have problems of one nature or another over the years. And while the physical problems that result from brain injury, that maybe loss of intellect or whatever, are just one portion of that and put the part oftentimes where social workers come into play are the emotional consequences of that brain injury and how that they play out in in the individual's relationships with the world around him or her 
So a brain injury is an insult to the brain caused by an external physical force that may result in a diminished or altered state of consciousness. That's actually a traumatic brain injury, I think. And about 1.7 million individuals sustain TBIs each year. That's, that's a lot of injuries. And for children and young adults, this is the type of injury that's most often associated with deaths due to unintended injury, brain injuries. The textbook goes on to describe a type of brain injury called an acquired brain injury or an ABI. And the text says it does not result from traumatic injury to the head, but rather it's something that's hereditary or congenital or degenerative and it occur after birth. These things include, uh, well, aneurysms, you know, strokes and things like that, infections, uh, you know, denial of oxygen, hypoxia, damage from substance abuse, those kinds of things. Other theories do consider TBIs to be uh, an acquired brain injury, and I, frankly, I'm not clear on why it wouldn't. They wouldn't be, but but they have a separate. They're a separate subset of acquired brain injuries and other theories. So interventions are are different for each uh, ABIs and TBIs. Now, if um, I assume if this question comes up in a test, you'd want to say that uh, traumatic brain injuries and acquired brain injuries are different. But a lot of people, a lot of the experts in the field really consider them, uh, TBIs, to be a subset of ABIs. But any brain injury of any type will affect cognitive, physical, and psychological skills. And typical psychological or emotional changes come in, in two different ways. One is the primary uh, change, which is something that's due to the injury itself. For instance, you know, errors in judgment because of some damage to the uh, logic center, for instance, in the brain or something like that. Uh, and then there's also a type of emotional uh, change that occurs that is considered to be reactive, which isn't from the brain injury itself, but it really arises from the adjustment to that injury and the consequences of that injury, things like depression after, you know, as the individual learns to cope with the changes, how he or she is able to relate to the world. So primary and reactive. The nervous system itself we're going to look at, now we're going to look at kind of just the broader picture of the nervous system. This this book begins, it's interesting because each section starts with the disorder and then goes into the description of the system. And it, I, I would have arranged it differently if I were the author, but in any event, the, this is how it is. So the nervous system provides the structure and the processes for communicating senses, or per, sensory perceptual and autonomically generated information throughout the body. There are three major subsystems that compose the nervous system. That is the central nervous system, which is really the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system, the, which are the sp spinal and cranial nerves. And the autonomic nervous system, which are the nerves that control our, our basic body functions, our basic body systems. The human brain itself is only a small part of the total bo body weight, but has as many as 10 million neurons, which is really pretty amazing. Now, when you look at the picture of the brain, so to speak, you know that, that uh, there are three major internal regions in the, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. Now, the forebrain is the largest portion of the brain and contains the cerebral cortex, which is where all the higher mental functions occur. And uh, that cerebral cortex is divided into hemispheres, left and right. They're connected by nerve fibers. Um, the left side of the brain, uh, generally controls, well it does, not generally, it controls the right side of the body and the right side of the brain controls the left. There's something that occurs there that, uh, you know, so that if you are um, right-brained, that means you're left-handed. And I think right-brained people typically are associated to be more creative. Left-brained people, the right-handed ones, are considered to be more logical. And that may have something to do with where the logic and creativity centers are uh, existing in the cortex. The midbrain, which is, I think, a much smaller portion of the brain and is somewhere in the middle, obviously, controls things like sleep. The sleep center is there, the pain center, uh, and controls uh, movements and senses and things like that as well. And then the hindbrain is is sort of the uh, the reptilian part of the brain, I guess is another term I've heard it used for it. You know that this includes the cerebellum, which you know really in, involves the basic physiological functions. You know, heart 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 rates and and respiration and those kinds of things
Now the cortex, the cerebral cortex, you know, we were talking about that being a part of the forebrain. That's certainly the largest part of the forebrain as well. And it has four lobes. Um, the frontal lobe is the largest of the lobes in the cortex that makes up nearly a third of the, of the surface of the cerebral cortex. And, and again here we talk about the midbrain, um, hmm, this is repeating itself, but controls uh, centers for sleep and pain and relay centers for sensory information. And then the cerebellum controls the complex motor programming. Now the basic working unit of the nervous system throughout the body is, is the neuron or the nerve cell. And each nerve cell has axons and dendrites. And if I remember my biology or anatomy lessons properly, the axons are sort of the the little uh, things that hang off the edge of the nerve cells that send the messages, and the dendrites are the things that hang off the end of the cell that receive them. So, the, and the connection between, or rather the gap between the two, the axons and dendrites is called the synapse. What happens is the chemical and electrical neurotransmitters uh, are used to basically run those uh, impulses back and forth between the axon and the dendrites. So that's how the nerves communicate with each other. The impulses travel from the cell body to the ends of the axons where they trigger the release of neurotransmitters. And then the adjacent dendrites in the next nerve cell has receptors that are shaped to fit particular kinds of neurotransmitters. And so when the neurotransmitter fits into that slot, then the message is passed along. And neurotransmitters have a function of either exciting or inhibiting nervous system responses, so they can do one or the other. And there are, I guess, many different neurotransmitters in the body, but the four main ones that are mentioned in the text here uh, are listed here, a dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonins, and amino acids. The dopamine influences emotional behavior, cognition, and I think has something to do also with the pleasure centers in the brain. Norepinephrine is um, secreted by the adrenal glands and, glands <laughs> and uh, influences emotional behavior and alertness and plays a role in regulation of anxiety and tensions. Uh, so a lot of times when you, when you have prescribed drugs, you know, you'll, you'll hear these different kinds of terms come up and related to different kinds of psychiatric or psychological disorders. There has been for a long time, there was this uh, belief that when a brain's cells were destroyed and, uh, and they used to tell us this about, you know, drinking alcohol and smoking pot, that once the brain cells were destroyed, they'd never replace themselves. And, and while there may still be some uh, some truth to that uh, to, in one way or another. One of the things that we have come to learn about the brain is that it, it can change its structure and uh, patterns of activities in ways that can sometimes compensate for those, for those losses in, in brain cells and things. That's called, this is called neuroplasticity, so that uh, clients with certain types of brain injuries in certain areas of the, of the brain, for instance, may be able to, you know, through therapy, be able to work in such a way that they can restructure the, the connections in their brains to work around some of those disabilities that are created by the accidents and injuries. Neuroplasticity. The, we're, we're just learning about the brain still. I mean, this is an area for any of you that are really geared for research. You know, this is probably going to be a big area for many years to come. We're just learning more and more as time goes on with this in this area. Moving on to the next system is the endocrine system, which uh, plays a role in our growth and our body's metabolism, how we, how we develop and learn, how we, you know, have memories and those kinds of things. And the endocrine system is made up of glands that secrete hormones into the blood system. And, and these hormones, like, like, uh, like those neuro, uh, neurons and or those neurotransmitters, I guess, that the hormones have specific receptor, receptors also, so that when the hormone is secreted from a gland, there is a specific target issue or target organ that they travel to. Um, the, one of the differences between the neurotransmitters and the uh, hormones is that the neurotransmitters have a very short distance to travel, whereas the hormones have a much, a much longer distance to travel in the body. So the endocrine system as a whole regulates the secretion of hormones uh, through a feedback control mechanism and, and is, is in a healthy functioning body is self-regulating. 
Now there are several several endocrine glands around the body, and these are just some of these. And each of these glands have have really have their own specific function. You know, for instance, the pituitary gland, um, you know, has something to do with uh, the adrenal cortex and stimulates cell divisions and bone growth and 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 those kinds of things. In the mammary glands, it it uh, st uh, stimulates the production of um, of uh, um, milk production and those kinds of things. Um, the pancreas has a lot to do with uh, regulation of blood glucose levels and and uh, produces insulin also for the body. The thyroid inv involves uh, a lot of things about growth and development and and stimulates the metabolic rate of all the organs in the body. Uh, the adrenal glands, you know, the, the famous thing about fight or flight, and we're, we're very familiar with that, you know. So, so each of these glands have their own specific functions uh, that, that uh, work in the body. Now, some of the organs in the body also have endocrine cells uh, that have primarily, uh, that, that function as an endocrine gland, but, but they're in an organ that doesn't have an endocrine function. And these are some of the organs that have endocrine cells. Uh, testes and ovaries are, are mentioned here as endocrine cells, uh, as an endocrine system. And, but in the, the chapter, you know, the, I noticed that the chart has the testes and ovaries listed as one of the glands in the body. So, I don't know if the authors uh, aren't quite sure how to classify them or what, but uh, uh, some, some again, some references will consider the testes and ovaries uh, a gland rather than, you know, a cell and other organs. Now there, there are some illnesses here that um, um, are caused by hormonal imbalances that we're familiar with, and that that you're you're likely to to uh, encounter in in your work. One diabetes mellitus, uh, type two diabetes, has become uh, um, you know more widespread certainly in the last ten or twenty years. The diagnosis of this and um, type one diabetes is uh, also called juvenile diabetes, which is something that individuals are generally born with or develop very early in life, whereas type 2 diabetes is, has its onset much later in life. And these conditions uh, result from a malfunction of the feedback control system, I think primarily associated with, with if, if I'm not mistaken, with the pancreas, so that the, the uh, body isn't producing the insulin it needs to produce, uh, or it may be producing too much. And so the balance between the insulin and the and the sugars in the in the system are are um, off, and and individuals with diabetes suffer either sugar lows or sugar highs, and it can cause all sorts of other problems in the body as well. So that's one common condition that that is an endocrine uh, endocrine disorder. Another one is uh, hyperthyroidism, hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism, uh, which involves an imbalance of the of the um, of the hormone thyroxine is secreted by the thyroid gland, and this this can affect, uh, um, you know, growth and and development in many ways as well. Um, you know, hyperthyroidism is an interesting thing, and this is another thing that the um, um, the Glicken text I use in, my, in one of my introductory courses he talks about thyroid disorders as one of those things that we often uh, confuse. Um, physical problems for behavioral disorders and with uh, with kids for instance that have thyroid imbalances and things like this they exhibit a lot of behaviors that look like they're just a disturbed kid and and uh, a lot of times um, I think clinicians find themselves treating the behaviors and not really having looked at uh, possible physical causes for for those uh, behaviors and things and so this is just one of those um, one of those disorders, I think, where a knowledge of the body really does help us in, in you know, in terms of uh, treating a, a client properly, it's, um, you know, uh, worth uh, referring our clients sometimes to physicians and things for tests to make sure that there aren't physical imbalances when it's otherwise assumed that there are emotional behavioral problems involved. It's really very remarkable, and I, I, I know some kids with thyroid disorders, and uh, once that is corrected, it's, it's remarkable the difference that you see in, in their adjustment. Moving on to the immune system, the, the uh, most uh, obvious disorder that uh, we deal with in, in, as far as the immune system is concerned these days, the one that's getting the most attention is HIV and, and AIDS. 
And uh, our text says that about a million Americans is infected with the HIV virus. And the HIV virus, at some point when the, um, we're going to talk about T cells in a minute, but when the T cell count goes extremely low, and, and there are a few other conditions, is when um, a person who has HIV is then considered to have AIDS. Now, when, when this um, disorder first became known, and really it wasn't known before the 1980s, um, it was essentially a you know a diagnosis that was a you know was a fatal it was a fatal disease and and the individual that was diagnosed with AIDS could plan on you know on end of life within a, a short amount of time. Over the years, drugs have been developed that um, while well, here they're called the highly active antiretroviral therapy that has allowed AIDS to become a chronic condition rather than a terminal disease. Now that it is still. Uh, there are still a lot of problems associated with that, and the individual still has to be, um, you know, as careful w with um, with his uh, with his health and with his behavior, or how, her health and her behavior, as as they would otherwise. But uh, it isn't necessarily a death uh, a death sentence any longer. Uh, and originally, as I think you you're probably aware, you know, that it was believed that. The AIDS virus, the AIDS disease, was primarily associated with with homosexuals. Uh, there were, I remember initially there were four groups, and they all had H. There was uh, H in their name. There were homosexuals, uh, heroin addicts, um, hemophiliacs, and Haitians. <laughs> were the four that were considered to be the highest risk populations in AIDS, and um, it was just kind of an interesting thing. But but you know over the of course, over the years, it's become obvious that that persons of both sexes and all ages, all racial and ethnic groups, all sexual orientations, uh, are affected by this by this illness. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, has reported six common transmission categories for HIV, as, and they're listed here. Um, the uh, heroin addicts was because of the sharing the needles, by the way, and the hemophiliacs had to do with the blood transfusions. And those are some things that we've come to learn. How Haitians figure into that, I, I don't know. But Now, the immune system itself is made up of organs and cells throughout the body that work together to defend the body against disease. When the body recognizes uh, that there is something in the, in the system that is exterior or foreign, this is called an antigen, then, then the immune system mobilizes its resources and attacks those antigens to try to keep the threat of infection or disease at a minimum. And here's an example of some antigens that, you know, fungi, bacteria, protozoa, viruses, those kinds of things. So there are several what are called autoimmune diseases, and, and these are diseases where the immune system is really kind of out of whack and out of coordination. This include things like rheumatoid arthritis and rheumatic fever, uh, lupus, um, and, and also, interestingly, psoriasis. And, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I myself, in fact, have, have dealt with psoriasis and just recently uh, found a treatment with um, a drug called Stellara, which is an injection she get three or four times a year and it clears up the condition now mind you this is an illness that i have dealt with for over 30 years and for the longest time the only intervention is because they didn't know what caused it and they didn't know you know they still don't know what causes it or how to resolve it but but um it essentially is is a disease where the where the immune system is overreacting and over responding and it's sort of marshalling its forces and it's attacking I think healthy cells uh, as though they were unhealthy cells and uh, and so um, this uh, this drug Stellara while it's it's uh, very good at suppressing that immune that that response of the immune system that is overly strong also creates the danger as my other doctor warns me of, of having more problems with immunities with other illnesses and things like this. So it reduces my immune response in general. So, you know, it's kind of a given or take, but uh, in any event, it's just kind of an interesting thing about, uh, about that that I've, I've had some personal contact with. So the organs in the immune system uh, develop 
lymphocytes or what we what we know as white blood cells more commonly and there there are several lymphatic organs around the body also uh, kind of like with the um, um, the last system that we, we talked about the anger endocrine system that uh, there are also some um, you know organs that have lymphatic tissue in them as well that aren't lymphatic organs in and of themselves but but uh, the bone marrow for instance our lymph nodes that's adenoids as well as our tonsils oh yeah i did list tonsils below didn't i the first line of defense against inhaled or ingested antigens uh the spleen and and also the thymus you know when uh, an individual has a serious accident and um you know, there are times when they've had to have the spleen removed. I know we can continue to live without our spleen, but we have to be more careful about about illnesses and diseases and things like that. The thymus, by the way, is the is the organ that triggers the development of those T cells, and those those T cells are the thing that slow down and f fight the antigens. So the slow down the antigens, I say, and fight the antigens, so that when the T cells drop, then the antigens become stronger in the body and, you know, create illnesses and infections and things like this. And this is why uh, um, uh, in the cases of, of HIV um, patients, when their T cell count drops real low, then, they, then they're considered to have AIDS. And AIDS is an autoimmune disorder. There are different kinds of immunities. There's a non-specific immunity where these scavenger cells circulate in the blood and the lymph systems, um, and they they will congregate at the site of a wound and ingest antigens when you know when you have some accident or something where your flesh is cut, and those kinds of things. And then there's specific immunity and or acquired immunity that involve lymphocytes. And, and a good example of this, of course, are vaccines and things like this. Uh, not only respond to infection, but they also uh, develop a memory of that infection and allow the body to make rapid defense against it in subsequent exposure. So sort of the notion behind flu shots, for instance, is that, you know, the, these um, lymphocytes are injected into the into the body and uh, the, the body then has a memory of that and, and, and watches basically for those antigens to, you know, to invade the, the system. The cardiovascular system uh, is, is, an, is another one of our uh, bodily systems that we're going to look at. As this slide mentions, more than one in five people have some type of cardiovascular disease, and, and this is the most common cause of death in this nation. I believe uh, cardiovascular diseases are more common even among males than females. Um, the system itself is made up of the heart and the blood circulatory system, including the arteries and veins and capillaries. Uh, a couple of terms that are useful for you here, the parasynthetic activities parasympathetic activities of the nervous system slow the heart rate sympathetic activities increase the heart rate just uh, just for your vocabulary's pleasure now the heart has uh, two sides the right and the left the separated by the septum and the, and you know the the heart's an interesting organ the way it works i i have to say and so the blood uh, with the uh, you know, comes from the body and is pumped into the right side of the the uh, heart in what is called the atrium. That is the um, the entry um, chamber of the right side of the heart, and the atrium then pumps that into the uh, right ventricle, which is this the other chamber, the lower chamber of the heart on the right side. And from there, the blood is pumped into the lungs, where it's oxygenated, and returns back to the heart in the left atria pumped into the left ventricle from the atria and then from there out into the body so that this is how the the um, heart and lungs work together to bring oxygen to the cells in the body the the, the blood i mean if you're the the uh, chambers of the heart by the way have um, um, you know blocks that prevent the the blood from flowing backwards so so uh, when, once that's closed, uh, the heart, the, the blood can only go in one direction. Blood pressure, which is something that, um, you know, we all become more and more familiar with the older we are, is the measure of the pressure of the blood against the wall of a blood vessel. And there are, there are two um, 
two measures in blood pressure. There's an upper or higher, the upper and lower number, and systolic is the, is the upper number, and that's when the heart muscles contract. What's the pressure on, against the blood vessels? And diastolic is when the heart muscles relax. So, and then high blood pressure, which, um, you know, it's certainly a physical condition is is also lately beginning to seem to be a social construct as well. You know, the medical community is changing its definition uh, more recently about what constitutes high blood pressure. And uh, so more and more people now are diagnosed with high blood pressure than had been even two or three years ago because the medical community has decided that uh, they needed to drop the numbers for what is a normal blood pressure. Now, is that a physical issue or is that a social construct? I, I suppose that's debatable, but um, I try to listen to my doctor anyway. Um, it has been called the silent killer high blood pressure because, you know, it's really not something you feel. You don't know you have it. You can't. You know, there isn't any kind of thing that tells you you have high blood pressure. And, and it still is the leading causes of stroke and is a major risk factor for heart attacks and kidney failure and those kinds of things. And there is some indication that high blood pressure has some hereditary qualities about it. The musculoskeletal system um, and the illness that uh, that the textbook focuses upon here is multiple sclerosis or MS and it is a neuroinflammatory disease that affects the myelin now myelin is the is the coating or whatever uh, uh, that wraps around nerve fibers it's an insulating uh, layer that that enables the nerve impulses to transmit quickly and efficiently along a nerve fiber so when that myelin when that layer is is inflamed or I guess broken in one way or another then uh, MS can result, and and obviously that that suggests that nerve impulses aren't aren't being uh, sent as they should be. MS is seen more often in younger persons, uh, 20 to 40 years of age. Although older persons can also be diagnosed with it, and this is a disease more frequently seen, or an, uh, a condition I should say, that is seen more frequently among women. And here are some of the symptoms that uh, that you see. But MS is a degenerative disease, so that over the years. Um, generally it becomes worse and worse and uh, I think ultimately results in death. Now the musculoskeletal system serves the function of supporting and protecting the body and also enables it to, to move, to have motion uh, through the contraction and relaxation of the muscles attached to the skeleton. There are over 600 skeletal muscles in the body, and it's you know about 40% of our body weight. And and not only does the musculoskeletal system support the body, but it also allows it to move. So it has you know this dual function. Particularly the large heavy bones of the legs support the body against the pull of gravity, and and also the skeleton protects other soft body parts. The rib cage, for instance, protecting the heart and lungs, and the cranial uh, bones protecting the brain. Those kinds of things. So, so the, uh, they protect and support support uh, various parts of the body. Bones uh, also are are a site for where your muscles attach. And again, as we were saying uh, just a few moments ago between the contraction and relaxation of those muscles, then we, we are able to move. And although the bone does seem like kind of a, well, we call them boneheads, you know, because we think there's nothing going on inside. But in fact, there is a lot going on inside these bones. It's a very active tissue. Um, and there's a lot of nerves and blood vessels in the ner in the bones. And inside the bones, of course, are the, the marrow and, and all sorts of things are happening in there. Joints are classified according to the amount of movement they permit. So there's an immovable bones like the cranium. There are uh, slightly movable ones such as our vertebra joints and, and freely moving ones. And, and another term for the freely moving joints are synovial. And you hear about synovial joints. That's what they're talking about, the knees and the elbows and that kinds of things. And there's two types of synovial joints, and that is the hinge joints like the knee or the elbow. Just kind of moves back and forth in one direction. Or ball and socket joints like the femur or the shoulder, uh, which allow the, you know, the, uh, the bones or the joints to, to move in a circular motion. When the protective coating at the ends of the bones begin to wear out, as often happens with age and, and use, uh, arthritis develops. And so the synovial joints are, are prone to arthritis at one time or another. It's a very painful uh, condition. 
Bones are connected to bones with ligaments. Bones are connected to muscles with tendons. This is another one of those basic biology things I think we probably all remember. And there's cartilage on the end of the bones that gives strength and support to the joint. Now there are many different kinds of assistive devices that have been developed uh, uh, by the medical community to help a person to communicate, see, hear, or maneuver when the body's own abilities have been um, compromised in one way or another. Um, I'm sparing you a lecture on body parts and uh, there are drawings in the book if you want to look at the male and female uh, genitalia, the, the organs and things like this for any references perhaps, uh, but uh, we, don't, we don't need to go through the, the biological facts of life here I think. So we talk a little bit about, uh, well I guess the condition here that they're talking about is unwanted pregnancies, you know, or pregnancy um, and contraception use is increased uh, steadily among sexually active teens in the United States. Um, I, I think that uh, this is just, you know, from my own awareness over the last 20, 30 years or so, but I, I certainly believe that the, uh, the AIDS epidemic, epidemic has had something to do with that. I think it's caused uh, young people to begin to recognize that there are consequences beyond pregnancy and and of course there's other venereal diseases that that we've always been exposed to or subject to anyway with unprotected sex somehow pale in comparison to AIDS I think at least in the popular uh, thinking. 78% of sexually active females, 85% of sexually active males use contraception during their first experience of sexual intercourse. It is um, of interest that um, many sexual encounters among adolescents occur with the use of alcohol however and um, the use of alcohol decreases the likelihood of of um, well at least of, of the use of condoms or whatever in, in sexual contact so take that for what it's worth but about three quarters of a million females but between 15 to 19 years of age have become pregnant in the United States every year um, Eighty-two percent of those pregnancies are unintended. About sixty percent end in birth, and a little over a quarter end in abortion. We have a high uh, adolescent pregnancy rate in the United States compared to other nations of the world, and um, uh, Scandinavian countries, for instance. You know, they they have a sex education. Denmark, Norway, Sweden. Finland, they have sex education woven into their um, educational system from, I think, from kindergarten from the earliest years in an age-appropriate fashion. And uh, the Swedish educational system, in fact, uh, they have a stated objective to uh, educate their youth about their sexuality and also how to, um, I guess, how to make use of it, let's say, you know, in their life uh, for the uh, for their enjoyment and pleasure as well as for all the other functions that their sexuality may experience. And with that, with all that education, the, the teen pregnancy rate in those nations is much lower than it is in the United States. So, you know, a lot of the, uh, the pushback in, in the communities about sex education in the schools is that, you know, they don't want to give, give the kids too much information. And we all kind of know that's, you know, that there's not, not really good logic behind that, that if you tell them about, if they teach them about it, that they're going to do it more often or whatever, uh, we're going to do it anyway. And and uh, an educated, sexually active adolescent is much less likely to, to uh, run into disease or unintended pregnancies than one who is not educated. Terms in, in when we talk about the reproductive system, and again, these are uh, terms that I think that we're all pretty familiar with in this group. You know, sex is the biological characteristic of the person. Gender is the social construct that is based on the accepted ideals of what it means to be male and female. That is, you know, who is masculine and who is feminine. I one of the one of my most favorite classes I ever taught was uh, a sociology or a human services course, uh, 350. Um, that uh, men and masculinity and and um, I taught that course several times in Kenai and, and I really enjoyed teaching the class and and it was sort of like uh, you know there are women's issues in many universities most universities perhaps women's issues courses but not always um, courses for you know men's issues or men and masculinity and there's some obvious reasons for that when you think we live in a patriarchy but the fact is that there's a lot of things about masculinity that that um, 
well, we don't really know about it. And, and uh, those courses are really valuable in that respect in, in terms of kind of spelling out some of the risks involved in traditional masculine socialization and and i think we're all too familiar with some of the results of that as particularly in the news in the last uh, two or three years so that's gender sexual orientation refers to the um, attraction we experience to other people erotic romantic affectionate whether of the same sex the opposite sex of both sexes or or the lack of of uh, of attraction it's distinct from gender identity and it's distinct from expression, sexual expression. Gender identity is, is defined as one's personal conception of oneself as male or female. And I don't even think this is actually mentioned in the textbook, um, but I dug this definition up, you know, off the web. That's the end of the systems perspective, and we have one slide to, uh, as I say, give a nod to the constructionist perspective, and and this is really, uh, you know, I think it's a lecture in and of itself, and, and I, in a way, I, I regret that this is only one slide. Um, this is a lot of what I talk about in my introduction to social welfare class at different points, as, as a matter of fact. But twice as many African Americans and Hispanics report being in poor or fair health as do whites. And adults living in poverty are five times as likely as adults with the highest incomes to report poor or fair health. And this probably has something to do with, with these factors that are just given a brief mention at the end of this chapter, which is differential access to health care. Of course, you know, in, in poor communities, um, it's, it's, there are fewer um, affordable health facilities. Also, individuals with lower income or without steady employment in particular may not have access to health insurance that enables them to go see physicians when they're ill, much less, much less for any kind of preventative purposes. Um, certainly, the the activity of our Congress right now is, um, and, and and probably over the next few years is something we need to keep an eye on in this respect because it can only uh, it well it seems to be headed for um, the, uh, increasing the problem with access to health care for poor and uh, moderate or marginally employed individuals, and so. Um, you know, this is just this is an area that certainly explains a lot about why it is that, uh, you know, individuals from, from the groups mentioned above have poor health. They are also uh, exposed more to environmental problems, you know, living in areas around, uh, you know, pollution, sources of pollution and things like this. This is particularly true in third world countries, by the way, where, where a lot of our corporations have gone because there are fewer restrictions on environmental uh, issues, you know, but, but, um, and it is true, I think, whenever there is an, any issue in the world, including uh, the poor environment, the poor, I mean, the, uh, you know, the e ecological problems in our world, um, the poor person is the, the poor is the first group of people to be most heavily affected and the, the most heavily affected of any group uh, by those kinds of concerns. Uh, individuals in minority groups and in um, lower socioeconomic groups often engage in behaviors uh, that uh, are likely to create uh, uh, health problems such as you know, heavier drinking, smoking, uh, risk behaviors, those kinds of things. There's more stress involved in being a member of the minority or being, you know, living in poor neighborhoods or being out of work chronically. And the neighborhood and the community that surrounds those individuals oftentimes are filled with people who are experiencing the same kinds of problems, the same risky behaviors, the same stressful lives, lifestyles, those kinds of things. And so when you talk about social construction, well, there's all of that. I mean, in terms of that there are more problems um, with the poor, um, as well as the fact that um, you know, just how we respond to different health concerns and different illnesses and things like this based on our income, based on our health insurance and those kinds of things. Uh, you know, as an example, I, I, I have said many times in, that, that uh, as a retiree from the state of Alaska, I, I just have a, a wonderful health care system. Now, having become Medicare eligible, of course, the, the, the feds have taken over a lot of my health insurance, but I still have my, my uh, 
my health insurance, previous health insurance, Aetna, as my secondary, and pretty much covers almost virtually all of my medical expenses, including prescriptions, uh, with the exception of a little bit of a, of a copay at the beginning of the year, or a rather a deductible at the beginning of the year. And uh, the shots for Stolera, the, the psoriasis shots, well, it has certainly made my quality of life better in, in uh, clearing up my skin conditions and things like this. I, I have to tell you, it's incredibly expensive. And and um, there is simply no way that I could uh, access that that uh, even even with the, with uh, having worked steadily and having had a decent job and a fairly reasonable income all my life, I could never have accessed that that treatment without a good insurance program. And many insurance programs wouldn't probably pay for it. So, and that's that's a really kind of a trite example. I mean, the the situations that individuals living in you know uh, lower socioeconomic groups and in minority groups and things like that are much much more serious and life threatening than that. So, as social workers, what, what, what do we take from this? We should, we should be sure to develop a knowledge of our body's environmental systems and how they connect with each other and how they interact with other dimensions of our human behavior. When we make assessments and we intervene with clients, we should recognize that those, in, those internal, those interior conditions of health and illness are influenced heavily by exterior environmental, social, political, cultural, and economic contexts, just like we were just talking about. This is an area, I think in particular, healthcare, which really needs uh, our attention and our interventions on a macro level as social workers. Uh, we should recognize that the exterior environmental meanings that we attach to health and illness not only influence the physical experience of that illness, and that health, but also the values and our emotional response that are assigned to health and illness. What the, an example of that basically is, you know, the AIDS crisis and things that, you know, how do we approach AIDS victims? How do we, how does the general public view them? Um, and, um, you know, how much are we willing to invest in, in, um, in continuing to seek a cure for that deadly disease? In assessment intervention activities, look for the ways behavior affects biological functions and the ways biological functions affect behavior. Evaluate the influence of health status on cognitive performance, emotional comfort, and overall well-being. It's it's a good thing if you have a client, particularly one that you're gonna that is experiencing some serious severe problems, you know, of a behavioral or emotional nature or and or clients that you're likely to be working with for a period of time, it really is a good thing to uh, try to make sure that the client has had a good physical, a good thorough physical checkup and to see if all those uh, systems are working properly because sometimes the explanation for the issues may rest in, in the, uh, the interior systems. And we should also consider the ways in which one person's interior environment health status affects other people in that person's uh, exterior environment as well. How does how is the rest of the family affected? Ah, another nod to systems. So you know, incorporate all our different social work roles and practice related to the health of biological system, and and these kinds of roles include. These, these types of interventions, you know, researching, being a clinician, an educator, a case manager, a service coordinator, prevention specialist, a policy advocate, all those, all those persons out there working in the social work field on micro and macro levels uh, with individual interventions or, or a larger research project, those kinds of things all have a role to play in, in, uh, in, uh, in assessing and treating the health of, of the biological system of the individual. So really everybody, uh, everybody should know this stuff and understand a little bit about how it connects to what's going on with, with the rest of the world. So that's it for chapter three. Um, I uh, trust that there's some things in here that you found that might've been useful to you. And as always, if there's any questions, please do contact me and I'll do my best to answer them for you. Thanks and that's it for this week.